Thank you, Kate, and thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, uh, my talk is the decline and recovery of the peregrine falcon on the Channel Islands. And for those of you who may not know, the peregrine falcon is a medium-sized uh, bird of prey, uh, about the size of a raven. The females are larger, uh, as in with most birds of prey, the females are larger than the males. They weigh about two pounds. Males weigh about uh, a pound and a half, about a third the size of the females. And uh, one of the best known traits of the peregrine falcon is that they are the fastest animal in the world. And um, guys who uh, are falconers and skydivers have uh, recently clocked the peregrine falcon at over 280 miles an hour in a dive. Um, 280 miles an hour. They attach little, little uh, speed uh, calculators, altimeter type things um, onto the tail of the peregrine, took the bird up to 15,000 feet, uh, put the bird out of the airplane, and the bird flew along behind the airplane, then they jumped out of the airplane and, and dove with the bird, and the birds just pass them like, like they're nothing. So that'd be um, the fastest, the fastest, fastest animal in the world, yeah. When I was a kid growing up, uh, the reason I, I got into peregrine falcons in the first place was uh, I had the World Book Encyclopedia, and I, I, I remember this. It may not be true, but I remember this, um, that when you looked in animals under A, uh, it had all the animals across the top of the page uh, sort of like they were in a race relative to their speed, and the peregrine falcon was way out front. Um, so that, that's one of the reasons I got into peregrines. Uh, the other reason was uh, I grew up on the East Coast, and there were no peregrine falcons when I was, when I was a kid in the 1960s. They were completely gone. Uh, and, and that just that whole idea of um, the, peregrine, uh, the peregrine falcon being close to extinction and then being brought back from extinction was fascinating to me. So that's one of the reasons I got into the, the business. So here on the Channel Islands, um, this uh, last year we did a survey uh, in 2007 of all eight of the Channel Islands, uh, something we hadn't really tried to accomplish before. Uh, in order to get a, a current status of, of what the peregrine falcon's um, uh, recovery is like. Historic population, we talk about the historic population being the pre-1940 population because the reason for peregrine falcon decline was DDT, which is an organochlorine pesticide that came into wide use during uh, World War II. And so all of the records of the historic population uh, primarily came from egg collectors around the turn of the century and into the 30s and 40s, um, egg collecting was a very popular uh, pastime hobby for amateur naturalists. And uh, they were collecting not only peregrine falcon eggs, but bald eagles, pelicans, ospreys, that sort of thing. Uh, these guys were competing. Um, they would go out and find a nest and keep it secret, uh, wait for the birds to lay a clutch of eggs and go in and scoop the eggs. But they kept very meticulous notes. And from those records, we were able to recreate uh, a portion of what we think the population on the Channel Islands was. Um, the pesticides were, were introduced in, uh, like I said, around uh, World War II, and, and that caused the decline of the peregrine. Uh, during World War II, very little egg collecting was going on because people had more interesting things to do. Uh, so there weren't guys going out there to the islands. From those records, we found that uh, the birds were resident on all eight of the islands. There's very uh, little evidence of actual breeding on San Nicolas and San Clemente. Those are the most remote islands, hardest to get to. Um, there were a, a pair of wings of adult peregrines found on San Nicolas in, uh, in, during the breeding season. Apparently, they had been shot, and, and the wings were all that was left. So that gives us an indication that the birds were at least resident on the island during the breeding season. Um, same thing with San Clemente, birds were seen during the breeding season. That gives us an indication that they may have actually bred there, even though there aren't records of nests on San Clemente. Um, but from these, from these records, uh, the, the, we figured that at least 20 breeding pairs occurred on the islands. Um, the documentation actually uh, names 15 or 16 sites where peregrines actually nested. But we think these estimates are very low because people weren't doing very, very thorough surveys. They were just going to the nest that they knew about. Uh, this is a peregrine falcon egg. And you can see, if you look real closely, you can see a toe here. And you can see the beak here of a chick that failed to hatch. And the reason they failed to hatch is because the female, the weight of the female incubating this egg crushed the egg. And the reason it crushed the egg is because the egg was thinner than normal. And the reason for that was DDT contamination. Um, DDT 
uh, was in widespread use. It was used for everything from uh, you know bark beetles in, in forest lands to uh, crop pests to body lice uh, and mosquitoes. So it was it was the miracle pesticide of the age and was used by the ton in California. Uh, and as a result, uh, it caused um, uh, uh, population decline, uh, wherein the, the population of peregrine falcons east of the Mississippi was completely extirpated by the 1950s, and uh, the channel, on the Channel Islands, um, uh, peregrine falcons were completely extirpated also. Uh, there were no records of peregrine falcon pairs on the islands between 1949 and the late 1980s. Um, the way uh, DDT caused eggshell thinning is it interrupts the transport of calcium from the bones of the female to the eggshell. And that's, that's where the calcium for the eggs comes from. It actually comes from the bones of the female. And DDT interrupts that transport. And it also interferes with the structure of the eggshell. If you look at an eggshell under an electron microscope, a healthy egg, it has a very regular pattern of pillars and pores in the structure. And if you look at one that's been contaminated by DDT, um, that structure is very disrupted. This is the California population that, as we know of it, um, do, um, as a result of surveys that were done in the 1970s. They could only find two nesting pairs and two individual uh, individuals holding territories. So this is Morro Rock. There was a pair here. Um, there was an individual bird here, I think, at Huff's Hole. Uh, I believe there's an individual here at Point Reyes, and then a pair in um, uh, Mendocino County. But uh, the survey was done of several sites that were known by egg collectors and falconers. I think uh, 60 sites were gone to, and that was those few birds were the only, the only birds that could be found in the state. Um, subsequent surveys found a few more birds, but the decline was um, on the order of 98 to 95 to 98 percent of the original population. So as a result of the decline, um, the, the, uh, at least uh, in North America, um, the Peregrine Fund um, started uh, at Cornell University and they pioneered some of the techniques for captive breeding and reintroduction. My boss, Brian Walton, uh, who unfortunately passed away last year, um, he, he went to school. He, he was very interested in, in uh, peregrines and uh, Tom Cate, who founded the uh, Peregrine Fund at Cornell University, did his master's work at UCLA. And Brian grew up in Palos Verdes and used to ride his bike to UCLA to read all, all uh, Tom Cade's work. And um, when he went to college, he found that there was only one pair of peregrines anywhere near a college in California, and that was at Morro Rock. So he went to Cal Poly and uh, did his graduate or did his um, bachelor's work there, did his graduate work at San Jose State, and uh, together with um, a veterinary surgeon and a biologist at University of California, Santa Cruz. They founded the Predatory Bird Research Group and uh, turned it from its original, in its original concept, which was a rehab facility, into a captive breeding facility. And between, it should be between 1976 and 2000, or 1977 and 2007, uh, we captive bred and released uh, over 1,000 peregrines in California with also a few birds that we released in Oregon, Washington, and Nevada. 37 of those birds we released on the islands. We released many more birds um, on the mainland within flying distance of the islands. And of those island releases, 12 birds were released on San Miguel, 17 on Catalina, 4 on Santa Cruz, and 4 on Santa Rosa. And we used three different techniques to reintroduce the birds into California. Um, the, the primary technique was uh, fostering, direct fostering, where if you had a pair of peregrines nesting, um, and during the reintroduction um, years, peregrines were still uh, affected by DDT and had thin-shelled eggs, especially the birds that lived on the coastlines. So we would climb into the nest and take the eggs before the birds had a chance to break them. We'd put dummy eggs in, and then we'd come back with two-week-old chicks. We waited until the chicks were two weeks old because then they could thermoregulate on their own. They could make the trip from the lab to the nest. And we'd climb down, take the dummy eggs out, put these big chicks in there. And every time the adults would come back in, and it was like, OK, there's two weeks out of my breeding season uh, that I don't have to feed these chicks. And they, they'd accept them every time. 
Um, the second technique we used was called cross fostering, where we would take prairie falcon chicks. Prairie falcons generally lay five eggs, uh, and so have more chicks um, in their nest. So we take those chicks out of the prairie falcon nest, put the peregrines in. They're very similar birds, and we'd pick places where the prairies had moved into former peregrine habitat in the absence of peregrines to do this. And, uh, and then we'd redistribute the prairie falcon chicks into other nests. And that was the cross-fostering technique. But where we had places that didn't have any adult peregrines, we used a technique called hacking. And this lower picture shows a hack box on San Miguel Island. Um, you'd put this box up. You'd put the peregrines in it when they were about a week old, or a week away from fledging. Uh, this bird up here in the, in the top right is about 35 days old, and they fledge at about 40. And um, attendants would stay at the site 24-7 and keep predators away, keep people away, and they'd drop food through a chute in the back of the box so the, the birds wouldn't associate the people with the food. And then about the time when the birds would normally fledge, one guy would climb in there and push them all behind a piece of plywood and, uh, and spray them down with a, a, a spray bottle and get them all wet. And we'd put some food out for them and take the front off the box, and then everybody would run away. And ideally, the birds would come out slowly, um, see the food, start to eat, dry themselves off, and then begin learning how to fly, take their first flights from the box. And being predators, they learn how to hunt and how to fly through play. And it, I, I liken young peregrine falcons to kittens with wings and jet engines. Um, <laughs> you know, they, they tail chase each other. Uh, they grab, they, uh, pardon my French, they grab ass, and uh, uh, they'll pick up sticks and, and f fly around with them and, and try and steal them from each other, drop them and catch them and that sort of thing. And, and that's how they learn to hunt. And eventually, they, like kittens, they learn to chase things uh, that aren't you know, themselves. The, the kittens learn to chase mice. Peregrines learn to chase birds. And once they catch one, they very quickly learn what to do with it. Um, so in, in this way, uh, they, they learn how to make it on their own uh, it's a lot more labor intensive. The hack site attendants have to stay there for about five to seven weeks while the birds learn how to hunt and provide food for them. They go out every morning before dawn, put the food out for them so the birds don't see them, and then just watch them all day and document their, pro their uh, progress. And after about five or seven weeks, the birds have started to learn how to catch things on their own and eventually disperse from the site. Um, this one bird up here is a, is a small male. He may actually be the one bird that founded the first nest on San Miguel Island, the first uh, pair to come back to the Channel Islands. Is the box completely dark until such time as you No, it, it's, it's covered on three sides, and then it has a barred front. So they can see out that front. They can see their habitat. And we kind of position it into the wind and give them a, an idea. And, and the reason for having them in there for a week is that they see that this is home. And, uh, and they're not afraid of it uh, when we first take the box off. They, they kind of know where they're going. And, um, and have an idea of what's, what's out there uh, so they're not uh, scared of it. And what was the purpose of spraying them down? The spraying them down is so that they don't bolt out of the box and fly away. If, if they, they have to learn that the box is where the food is and the box is safe. So if you spray them down, they can't just fly. Um, they come out and they preen and they dry themselves off in the sun. They relax. You know, it's, it's very traumatic, the taking away of the box. And, and there's a guy in there in the box with them at first, and that's very scary. Um, we take a piece of cardboard, and we, we get them behind this piece of plywood, and we put the cardboard up there after we spray them down, and then we take the cardboard away, and then we put it back. And then we take the cardboard away, and then we put it back. And we do that for like five or ten minutes, so they don't know when it's safe to come out. And then eventually we retreat, and it usually takes them about a half an hour to get up the nerve to come back out. This cliff here on the left is Hoffman Point on San Miguel Island. And this is the first cliff to be reoccupied on the Channel Islands by the one male who stuck around from, from the Santa Cruz releases, or the San Miguel releases, and uh, a female who came from the mainland. And it turns out that the males don't go as far from the nest as the females. And uh, the females tend to range up to 200, 300 miles from their natal territories. The males um, usually go you know, anywhere from 5 to 50 or 100 miles away. So this male stuck around and lured in a female, and they set up shop here in 1986 and, and became the first pair to become reestablished on the Channel Islands. Um, we used to think that, you know, given the historic population records, that you know, maybe 20 birds would, would be the limit of how many peregrines would fit on the Channel Islands. Um, and that would mean you know, maybe two pair on San Miguel. Um, last year, when we surveyed 
we found seven pairs on San Miguel Island. And every cliff that you see here, with the exception of the island, has a pair of peregrines nesting on it. And they're all very close. They can see each other. But there's so much food out there. And you can see all these um, seabirds out here in the water just below the cliff. There's so much food out there that it's enough for all these peregrines to make a living. And they just sort of partition their uh, territories. So they, you know, the peregrines are very territorial. But uh, the more prey density, the smaller the territories are. So they've, they've learned to get along. And the island out there, Prince Island, is uh, a breeding colony of, has a breeding colony of uh, gulls and murelets and auklets. So it's a. What is their most common prey? Um, well, for the Channel Islands, seabirds are their most common prey. Uh, it depends on if you look at it in terms of number of individual birds or the biomass. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But urban birds, uh, peregrine, I mean, uh, pigeons, starlings, uh, the birds on Santa Rosa are eating uh, more uh, metal larks than anything else. Uh, the birds on San Miguel are eating a, a higher percentage of seabirds, such as gulls, phalaropes, um, auklets, and murelets. Um, in 1992 to 1994, uh, I participated uh, on a study of the peregrine falcon's winter diet. And this was for the original Montrose court case. Uh, Montrose, um, the EPA uh, and the federal government sued Montrose for uh, the manufacture and illegal dumping of DDT. And uh, part of the process of, of, dump, of manufacturing DDT, uh, which was done in Torrance, California, was to flush out the system into the LA sewer system. And there's a, 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 the sewer runs out into the ocean off the Palos Verdes coast. And, and so consequently, there is a huge DDT deposit uh, on the bottom of the ocean there. And um, in order to determine damage, um, several groups studied the peregrine falcon, the bald eagles, and the pelicans, and the uh, marine mammals, and that sort of thing. And, and I was working on peregrine falcons at the time. And by 1994, there had been four pairs reestablished on the islands. All of them were on the northern, the four northern islands. Um, and at that time, we found the DDT, DDE, which is the breakdown product of, uh, of DDT, um, that DDT, DDE contamination and eggshell thinning was continuing to, to depress the reproduction of the peregrine falcon. So by 1994, this is the California state population. And you can see there's, here's the nine pairs on the islands. Uh, the birds had be started to become established here in the city of Los Angeles, mostly on skyscrapers. Uh, a couple of birds down in, in San Diego County, uh, up here um, on Vandenberg Air Force Base at Point Arguello. And the Big Sur Coast was pretty well populated. But you can see the majority of the birds are up here in the northern interior. Most of our reintroductions were from San Francisco south. And this is where um, DDE was continuing to depress reproduction. The birds up here in the northern, what we call the northern interior, the northern coast range, um, are primarily eating a, a land-based diet. And they're in the river systems, nesting on cliffs along the Klamath River, Smith River, um, Russian River, and that sort of thing. These birds tend to came, um, tended to come back on their own very well and had very little eggshell thinning and, uh, as, as opposed to the birds south of the Bay Area. So our current study, the, the one we did in 2007, um, was funded by Montrose as a, as a result of the court settlement. Uh, there was money for um, um, resource uh, reintroduction, resource recovery, uh, and surveys. And so they funded our study in, 19, in 2007. And we surveyed all, all eight of the islands by boat and or on foot for occupancy to see how many peregrines were actually out there. And we were trying to count both resident birds and wintering birds. Um, and then the next step was to monitor the resident birds for their reproductive success and the productivity. And then um, we attempted to collect samples from all the nests that, were, um, that we could find. Um, the samples that we wanted to collect were addled eggs, which are eggs that failed to hatch, and test them for contaminants, uh, eggshell fragments to measure and, and uh, look at those measurements against earlier measurements to determine the trend in eggshell thinning, and then look at the prey remains uh, to see if they were still taking the same kinds of birds that we that we found uh, back in 1992 and 94. 
And as a result of those territories, we visited 35 territories. I mean, as a, as, a result, yeah. as a result of the study, we visited 35 territories on eight of the islands. We determined 25 of those territories to be active, and that means they had a pair that were resident that were attempting to breed and lay eggs. Two of the territories were what we call transitional in that they had one adult bird and one immature bird as a pair, so they didn't breed that year. Two territories were occupied by a single adult bird, and five of the previously active territories that we had documented in the past were in, inactive. Uh, there were two that we couldn't determine their status, and 10 of those um, uh, active territories were new, newly confirmed in 2007. And that's really a result of, of being out there um, and doing a more thorough uh, survey. So, and the monitoring results, now this is a typical scenario of monitoring a peregrine cliff. The peregrines are nesting on the white cliffs here on the backside of Santa Cruz Island. And this OP, where the spotting scope is here, is about a mile away, and that's the closest we can get to get a good view of the cliffs, uh, but not be so close that we're affecting the bird's behavior. So uh, it takes a very dedicated person to get out there and watch all day long from a mile away and try and, and pick up um, these crow-sized birds that are flying in and out and determine from their behavior because they can't see where the nest is. They can see where the birds go in and out of the cliff, but determine from their behavior whether or not they're breeding, whether or not they're successful, when prey's coming in, and that sort of thing. Um, the monitoring results, we determine the outcome, the reproductive outcome at 24 of the territories, 24 of the 25. 20 of the pairs laid complete clutches. Um, peregrines generally lay three to four eggs, and they don't start uh, really hard incubating where the birds don't leave the eggs untended for more than five minutes until they have a complete clutch of three or four eggs. So 20 pairs laid complete clutches. Um, four of those pairs were breaking eggs as they were laying them and never got to a complete clutch. 16 pairs, so two-thirds of them actually hatch their eggs, and they produce 35 young. So that's 1.46 young per active pair. Seven pairs, one-third of the population of the islands fail to reproduce. Sample collection um, means getting to the nest to get the eggshell fragments and the eggs and the prey remains. And peregrines are obligate cliff nesters. Uh, they tend to like large cliffs uh, where nobody's going to get at them. Um, some, of the, some of the sites on the Channel Islands, especially on San Miguel, Santa Rosa Island, the cliffs are very easy to get to, but a lot of them, like that first uh, uh, slide I showed with uh, Hoffman Point and this site here on Santa Cruz Island, are very big sea cliffs and very difficult to get to. Um, you can't quite see the top of this cliff, which is up here, and the bottom of the cliff is about 100 feet below where you can see, but um, this is the climber right here. That's his t-shirt. That blue is his helmet. And he's still not to the eyrie, which is in this cave right here. So this guy is Jeep Pagel. He works for the Fish and Wildlife Service. He's worked for us since the 1980s. He likes to say it takes a good lobotomy to do this kind of work. <laughs> um, I, I like to think that we just have an eye towards safety, and we're very careful about how we do things. Down. Repel down from the top is generally how we do it, especially with the sea cliffs. You can't really you know, climb up from the bottom. But that also means you have to go back up. Yeah. yeah. And addled eggs, eggshell fragments, prey remains are what we're trying to get from the nest. So of the, eight, of the uh, 24 territories that we were able to determine um, whether or not they were uh, productive this year, we got into 18 nest sites. Um, we, sam we sampled the eggs from there and measured them. We're using a, a very uh, precise uh, bench um, measuring device that measures to one thousandth of a millimeter. And um, we compare the eggshells that we get now against those eggs that were collected by the egg collectors prior to the introduction of DDT. So there's a standard California eggshell thickness for peregrine falcons. And the eggshells on the Channel Islands the total combined from this year average 17.9, almost 18 percent thinner than those pre-DDT eggs. The range there is between 7.7 .7 and, and almost 30 percent thinner than the pre-DDT eggs. And that shows a slight improvement since the 1992-94 study where the eggs were 19.4 percent thin. 
and we also wanted to look at the breeding season diet. And what we find is in terms of biomass, like I was saying before, the large percentage of the prey coming into the nest, and this is not really the prey that's making uh, the, the birds lay thin-shelled eggs because we were looking at what comes into the nest. So this is a little bit after uh, the egg-laying period. This is the spring diet. Still uh, a large percentage of seabirds by weight. And that's primarily because uh, a lot of the seabirds are bigger. California gulls, Cassin's auklets, murelets, that sort of thing. Um, if you look at the number of individual birds, the minimum number of individuals, there are more land birds coming in, but these are passerines that are smaller than the seabirds. So you really want to look at the weight of, of the biomass and the weight of the birds that are coming in because that's what's carrying most of the DDT. So compared to uh, 92, 93, 94, um, comparing that to 1997, we see that the population has increased from nine pairs to 25 pairs. And here is our population graph from 1986 on up. And pretty steep increase there from around 2003 to 2008, the number of new pairs. It, it, it's actually a bigger increase than we ever envisioned. Um, there are more peregrines on the Channel Islands now than uh, we kind of predicted. Granger Hunt, who ran the 93-94 study, thought that there might, you know, the Channel Islands might hold 30 pairs, including all of the different islands. Well, we're close to 30 pairs now, and I think there's still room for more. The percent failure went down a little bit. So in 93-94, 37.5% of the birds of those nine pairs failed. Um, this last year, one third of the 25 pairs or the 24 pairs failed. Productivity has increased a little bit, 1.46 as compared to 1.31 young per nest. And the eggshell thinning has improved slightly from 19.4% in 93-94 to 17.9%. It's, it's really a very slight increase. If you graph it, those two, um, those two, C, those two years, um, it actually looks like a, a, a bigger change than if you look at it over the whole term of the, uh, the recovery. Um, this is all the eggshells that we've collected since 1986, and you can see that the eggshell thinning, this trend line, has changed very, very little uh, in that time period. So DDT, even though it's been banned since 1972, I think, um, is still having a, a, a really negative effect on uh, the eggshell thinning and the productivity of, of birds in the Channel Islands and also on the rest of the coast of California. But the reason that the population is continuing to grow is that um, the birds that are living on the mainland of California are not running into as much DDT. You know, DDT gets washed down um, in, into the streams and rivers and sewers and that sort of thing and into the marine environment and then comes up through the food chain. Uh, whereas birds that are eating more of a land-based diet, eating more pigeons, meadow larks, blackbirds, that sort of thing, they're getting less DDT, and those birds are reproducing better uh, at a higher rate, and they are buffering the, um, the lack of reproductivity on the Channel Islands. Of the two birds that we trapped this year that were banded, uh, both of those birds came from the mainland. So there's still recruitment from the mainland to the islands that's, that's buffering the lack of reproductivity on the islands. Sure. Well, if you compare the North California mm -hmm. shells to that, where would that line go? Would yeah, the the Northern California eggs are um, lo lower than 17 percent. They're they're more in the 15, 12 to 15 percent range, and so for the state, the level is down below that 17 percent. And the 17 percent is actually pretty, um, not necessarily critical, but it's it's a telling number in that for a population they found when they were studying the birds and eggshell thinning during the declines uh, and, the, and the beginning of the recovery, a population that had an eggshell thinning of 17% was a declining population, had a trend of declining population. Um, the state population is less than that. The islands is, you know, right just at about 18%. So, um, but if, if that were, if the, if the islands were the only place where peregrines were existing, the population would not be growing most likely. They, they would not be able to sustain themselves. But because we have a very healthy mainland population, um, 
the population, uh, the subpopulation on the islands just continues to, th to grow. Now this uh, graph here, the upper line, shows the territories that we know to be know to have been active at least once since the decline. So these are all the territories in California that have had a pair of peregrines nesting. Not all of them are active in any one year, but we document them as we, as we discover them. Um, and this purple line below that goes halfway up um, comes from our very intensive period of, of uh, monitoring the birds where we were going to every known eyrie every year between 1976 and 1992. And from the ratio of known iris to active iris, um, we, we can estimate uh, the, the latter years and get an estimate of the current population trend. Right now we think that um, given the number of known territories, uh, the population in California is at least at about 245 to 250 pairs in the state. This lowest line is the Channel Islands population, which mirrors the trend in, in population growth. It seems like a really small number, so. It seems like a really small number, but the, you know, peregrines being very territorial and uh, having specific needs for nesting, they're not tree nesters, so they can't nest anywhere. You, there's only so many nest sites that are what we call serviceable breeding locations. You've got to have a big cliff, and you've got to have enough uh, prey around. Uh, for a pair of peregrines to be successful. So um, uh, 300, 350 pairs in the state is probably what the population was uh, prior to um, the decline. And um, one sort of anecdotal fact that the peregrine fal falcon population is very, very healthy is, um, I don't know if any of you have been up to Morro Bay and have seen Morro Rock. And back when there were only two nesting pairs in California, one of those pairs was on Morro Rock. And they're probably, with the exception of when they were blasting Morro Rock uh, uh, as a, uh, for quarry rock, there have probably been peregrines nesting on that rock since the bird evolved. And um, there, there are now two pairs nesting on Morro Rock and, and other pairs on the subsequent, uh, um, what they call the Seven Sisters, the other uh, rock outcrops that lead into San, uh, San Luis Obispo. Nobody ever thought that you could have more than one pair of, I mean, Morro Rock is only is less than a quarter mile wide. And if you drew a line between the two pairs of peregrines, it's less than 400 meters. And at one point in time last year when the birds fledged, there were nine peregrine falcons flying around Morro Rock calling it home. <laughs> so, so the population is doing very well if, if, if they can crowd uh, Morro Rock like that. Okay, yes? You said when they were growing up sort of like kids, mm -hmm. like kittens, but right. you know, if they play with each other, when mm -hmm. did they, you say they're very, very territorial. So do they actually prey when they eat their own kind they catch it? Well, um, what I mean by territorial is they will defend their territory against um, other, other birds of prey, especially around uh, fledging time, but also against other peregrine falcons um, when, they, when they've claimed a nesting territory. And I've seen a lot of uh, territories, uh, including here on the Channel Islands, uh, where one bird will be incubating and then the male will be out flying around. He comes in with this intruding female and, and it's a floating adult, what we call a floating uh, adult. In any, pop, any healthy population you have, like I said, only a certain number of breeding territories that are suitable and all of those territories are full. Um, but you have this surplus of adult birds that aren't fit enough yet to hold the territory and young birds that are just coming up. Those are the floaters and they're out looking for a territory um, they will either fly around until they find um, a, a cliff that has one adult on it because that, uh, its mate got into an accident, got shot or poisoned or ran into a fence or, or um, you know, ran into a building if it's an urban site, uh, or they will actually fight over that territory and they will actually kill, them, kill each other uh, in order to break into a territory. Same thing with, the, with golden eagles. Um, they, will, they will kill each other over territories and try and move in. And there's enough uh, peregrines uh, in the population, enough floating birds that if one does have an accident, it's usually a week or two before it gets replaced by another adult. Um, so, um, has, does that answer your question? Yeah, so that makes it even more curious why there would be that many on in Morrow. Well, it's it's because the the prey density is is such that um, they the territory shrink. If 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 it's um, if there's enough uh, resources for the birds to not have to move very far they accommodate each other. In Long Beach, uh, LA Harbor, there are seven pairs of peregrines and they rarely move more than a, a mile away from their nest sites. But if you go up into um, the Sierras, 
the territories are much bigger because the prey is, is more dispersed. And so those peregrines will defend a much bigger territory against other peregrines. Um, so that, that's why you can, you can pack them in in areas where the prey uh, is, is much more dense. How do the peregrine numbers compare to eagles, for example? Because they sound like they have pretty similar characteristics. Yeah, um, they, they do tend to nest near waterways, uh, as bald eagles do. And the bald eagle population has come back um, very well. Uh, still, Southern California doesn't have a lot of bald eagles yet. Um, I think there's a, a one or two pairs around Riverside County, but um, they're, they're, they've come back very well in Northern California. They've been reintroduced to the Channel Islands extremely well. Uh, there's birds nesting in um, uh, up by Lake Kachuma, um, but uh, they're, they're still recovering in California, and I think they're probably on par uh, with the peregrine falcon recovery. I, I, I couldn't really tell you um, uh, what the numbers of bald eagle nesting pairs is, because uh, I just don't follow that. Um, I do know that we get a lot of wintering birds uh, in California um, on all the lakes around the Sierras and whatnot, and th that the population is recovering really well. You know, if you go up to Haines, Alaska, a certain time of the year, mm -hmm. you, you, you can see literally hundreds, mm -hmm. maybe even thousands of bald right. eagles. Right. Which kind of makes you wonder about this idea of having a territory. Well, those are, those are birds that are migrating. California birds, uh, at least California peregrines, uh, don't migrate. They stay on their territories year round because the, the winter is so mild that uh, everybody else comes here. And so they have to stay on their territories in order to defend it against birds that are coming in from, from uh, other areas. You, we get uh, birds down here from ca Canada and Alaska, uh, Oregon, Washington, anywhere where the winter is, is uh, relatively harsh and the prey moves out, the peregrines have to follow. Um, but the California birds tend to stay put and stay in their territories. Um, bald eagles, uh, they will stay on territory, um, but again, we get this influx of wintering birds, but the young bald eagles tend to migrate away from their natal territories, and they go north uh, about uh, August, September, and they go up to the rivers that have salmon runs and steelhead runs, and that's where they spend their first year uh, feeding on this, on this salmon and steelhead. And that's the same thing around Haines, Alaska. You get those salmon steelhead runs, and those birds are just going in and gorging themselves on that. Yes? Um, you, I take by what you say they, they mate for life. Uh, but do they stay together all year, or do they just come together for a few months during breeding? And no, they, they stay together all year, and they continually reinforce the pair bonding. Uh, there's a lot of courtship display, um, a lot of uh, the feeding, the male feeds the female. During the winter, there's not so much of that, but the breeding season starts right at winter solstice. So um, the, the babies are, are, are with them up until June or July, and then during the fall, the, the adults are on their own pretty much. But uh, right about the 21st of December, as soon as the days start getting longer, the breeding season starts and the birds start in the courtship, and they're right at the nest sites then. Mm -hmm. To the time they leave their parents, how long is that? It's about 40 days from hatching to fledging, yeah. and then about five to seven weeks from fledging till when they disperse. So the, they generally lay their eggs in March, hatch in May, and then disperse by July. Yeah, there's, there, we know of three territories on Anacapa, one on west, one on middle, one on east. We didn't really cover middle this year, so we don't know if the east pair is the same as the middle pair. The east pair we found new this year, but right in Cathedral Cove is a nesting pair of peregrines. And they were successful this year. I think they had one chick this year. Um, but yeah, so there's the three pair on Anacapa. Um, there's seven pairs on Miguel, eight pairs on Santa Rosa, and seven pairs on San, I mean, um, on Santa Cruz, and one pair on uh, Santa Barbara. Yes? How long do they live approximately? Approximately in the wild, 12 to 16 years. Um, I know of the, the record in California for longevity was an 18-year-old male uh, that was nesting on the Union Bank in, in downtown LA. Um, and longevity for a bird in captivity was a bird that I had for a while. He was 23 years old when he passed away. 
But in the wild, it's, it's harder to make a living, so they generally um, don't last as long. So this is, is the estimated 2007 California population. And you can see that the islands is now, have now really filled in. Um, I mean, it's hard to fit any more dots in here. They're just completely, the, the central coast is really filled in. Southern California is still starting, uh, is still filling in. And then um, there's still some gaps here in eastern San Diego County and the Modoc Plateau uh, that are all historic sites that have yet to be uh, reoccupied. But uh, the stronghold of Peregrines is really in this northern interior where um, fully a, a th uh, two thirds of the population exists. Is there a noticeable difference in the thin, uh, thinness of the eggs on, say, San uh, Catalina Island compared to the northern? We haven't gotten any eggs from Catalina yet because uh, we haven't documented any nesting since the, re since the decline. The, we found two pairs there um, uh, the year before last and the, and the year before that, but uh, did not um, record any any egg laying. Uh, we couldn't pin down an eyrie. It's it's likely that if they were laying eggs, they were breaking them as they laid. But last year, those birds were gone. So and that that is the closest to the DDT dump, yeah. which is here off the Palos Verde shelf. And so we would expect that the birds are going to be most contaminated here. Um, the good news is that here on Santa Barbara, where the birds have been in residence since 1995. Uh, last year was the first documented um, successful nesting. They had three chicks last year. So that's the good news. Just a question. Comparing this situation to the previous map at the beginning, when mm -hmm. you had only four dots on the map, right. um, the species will have been through a uh, pretty severe bottleneck genetically. Mm -hmm. Has anybody looked at any of the genetic aspects? They have, and, and because the peregrine is so wide ranging, uh, it has a fair amount of genetic div diversity, and they, we haven't looked at it in California, but um, other folks have looked at um, uh, the genetics of the birds in the Rocky Mountains, and there's this graduate student that's actually looking at the California birds and the Oregon birds right now, and they, they really have seen no consequence of, um, no real genetic, um, no real um, effect from a lack of genetic div diversity. So uh, it, you know, it's like when the, the um, island fox or when the gray fox moved out to the Channel Islands, it was probably only a few pairs that started the whole population on, on all eight of the islands. And um, uh, you know, those, those foxes survived and flourished and evolved into what they are. So even though um, it's, it's pretty obvious that the peregrine population got down to a very few pairs, um, there hasn't been any real lasting effect. And the birds that we used for reintroduction were all um, the uh, continental subspecies and not subspecies of peregrines, but they came from the Rocky Mountains and from California and Baja, uh, California. Uh, so we tried to keep the diversity as, as high as possible when we were doing the captive breeding. And the conclusions to our, our most recent study are that occupancy and productivity and eggshell thinning have improved, but only slightly. Um, occupancy more so than anything else, but the productivity and eggshell thinning have only really slightly improved. The mainland population is probably buffering the negative effects of DDT contamination of the Channel Islands subpopulation. The southern islands really have yet to be recolonized and that um, continued monitoring is advised. Because when you only look at the birds, say, every five or 10 years, you only get really a snapshot of what's happening. Uh, but when you look at it over the span of the reintroduction, you really get a better idea of what the trend is. Uh, these are the groups that uh, helped out on the study, um, not the least of which was the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary and the National Park Service. And I want to thank you all for coming. And these are the these are the Santa Barbara uh, Island uh, chicks. <laughs> Any more questions? Would yes. Would you ever consider installing one of those cameras so that uh, those of us with the computers uh -huh. can watch the nests instead of having a poor guy up there twenty four seven? <laughs> we do have a we do have a camera on uh, the San Jose City Hall nest. Um, and unfortunately, you guys are right at the end of the breeding season. The, the birds have fledged. Uh, they only appear on camera every once in a while now, but uh, they had three young this year. 
uh, and they, you know, like the, the bald eagle cam, they've created quite a following. And there's a Yahoo news group of people who talk every day about, didn't, you know, they're, they're worried about the one in the back that didn't get fed enough during <laughs> feeding time. They think he's sick because he's sleeping through the feeding time. And, uh, they did alert when the oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, and, and we, we actually monitor, we, we drive the camera um, during the day and, uh, and then we monitor the website and people you know, ask questions of us and so whoever's on that day gets to be you know, expert for a day and, and answer all those questions. But um, the, the logistics of putting one on a uh, more um, rural nest uh, are, are quite high. Um, if the Park Service is interested, we're, we're welcome to lend our expertise um, and go ahead and do that. But um, as I was talking to, to Kate about earlier, um, when you start naming the chicks, the people on the computers be get, you know, get very vested in the, the, be in the outcome of those chicks. And, and uh, it's, a, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. But they take it, they take it very personally uh, to the exclusion of all the, el all the um, other biology that's going on around the, the state. So... But yeah, we're all for it. Yes? It seems like DDT impacted the peregrines a lot more than, say, the, fal or the, uh, the uh, pelicans or the bald eagles. It seems like it impacted them earlier and they had a much later recovery. Is, is right. that true? So well, different, different birds have different um, uh, sensitivity to DDT. And uh, when it was in use, those birds at the top of their food chains, the osprey, the bald eagle, the brown pelican, peregrine falcon, they all took it in the shorts and, and populations really declined. But when it was banned, um, not as much of it was getting into the environment. And so uh, a brown pelican that has eight parts per million in its egg uh, may be able to hatch those eggs, whereas a peregrine uh, may not. And so the, the peregrines have had a, a much more lasting effect of the residual DDT. Same thing with the bald eagles, especially in proximity to um, the dump than say the the pelicans have, and uh, and then those birds that are farther away from the dump site, you know, ospreys nesting up in northern California, bald eagles and peregrines um, have fared much better. Yeah. So what's up actually happening at, at the dump site in terms of mitigation? Uh, as far as I know, nothing. They they they. Yeah, the, you know the the ideas of what to do about it have ranged from sucking it up with a giant vacuum cleaner to capping it with a bunch of you know tons and tons of sand there's several hundred if not thousand metric tons of ddt raw ddt laying on the bottom of the ocean there and uh, all of the ideas that they've come up with have been shot down in that um, the thought is that it'll end up bringing more uh, ddt up into the um, water column than yeah yeah if you go down and disturb it it's it's going to have a, a greater impact on uh, short term um, than, uh, than just leaving it alone. So there's really nothing you can do at this point to speed that? Not really. You know, you can continue to monitor the resources and, and as we've seen, uh, they're coming back very well and bald eagles have actually hatched eggs on, on their own on Catalina Island this year, uh, which is a real milestone. Um, so, you know, if you continue to uh, manage the population and, and that they have a, a buffering portion of their population that's not as effective, um, I think all those particular resources are going to do do well. At least uh, they're going to. The peregrine is no longer in any danger of going extinct. In fact, the, the petition for delisting was submitted last year, and they're probably going to be delisted uh, in the state um, within the next year or two. Yes. Mm -hmm. hey, hey, Catherine, you spoke of earlier. Mm -hmm. is that a no, that was a, that was a, a, an early form of science, uh, a, a, like a museum collection kind of thing. And these guys would uh, compete for who had the most complete sets of eggs. And then they would just you know, blow the contents out and save them um, and, and put them in their collections. And if you go to um, the uh, Western Foundation for Vertebrate Zoology over there in Camarillo, you'll find a lot of eggs that were collected during that period from the Channel Islands and elsewhere in California, both bald eagles, peregrines, pelicans, all manner of, uh, of bird eggs. That was just an early uh, naturalist hobby. Yeah, Kate? Uh, I have a comment and a question. You mentioned that the survey in 2007 was funded by Montro. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, 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 no. The Montrose Settlement Council. Right. So yes. It's a, it's a through the court settlement. You bet it's paid and the state and the federal government now have a restoration fund. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is, um, along the lines of an earlier question, if you look at the eggs from the collected from the Northern Islands, mm 
-hmm. you see a gradient in terms of uh, thinning being greater on one island as compared to the other, maybe because the diet is a Absolutely, and, and I, didn't, um, I didn't go into that in this talk, but um, the different islands all have different um, levels of thinning and levels of productivity. In fact, the two neighboring islands of San Miguel and Santa Rosa um, have about the widest disparity between uh, eggshell thinning and, and productivity. Santa, San Miguel is the worst of the, the five islands that had um, peregrines that made it this year. Uh, Santa Rosa is the best. And the reason for that, if you, if you remember the graphs of um, uh, biomass of, of seabirds uh, as the prey and, and land birds uh, is, uh, being a greater percentage in terms of minimum number, number of individuals. If you think of those as in terms of San Miguel and Santa Rosa, that's the way it went. Um, Santa Rosa is a much more of a grassland uh, environment and has a pretty substantial um, passerine population, meadowlarks, morning doves, things of that nature. And that's what the peregrines were eating more of. Uh, there's not a lot of colonial seabird nesting there um, as there is on, on San Miguel Island. So um, there was a huge difference between those two islands. Yes? I, I one time saw a peregrine fall can take a, a pigeon in downtown Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. It's a quite a sight. But yeah. I can't imagine one taking a California gull. California or a Western gull. Or a Western yes. gull. Yes. And I, I, haven't s I haven't seen them take them myself. I've seen them carry them, which is usually a downhill sort of thing. <laughs> um, but I've, I've, I've talked to you know, observers that work for me that describe them a lot of times as, as a knockdown, drag out kind of a fight. Wow. Where, and it's usually a female peregrine against a western gull. And the they, western gull weighs a little bit more. Um, but the peregrines have momentum as their, as their uh, aid. And, and this, this one fight that I was thinking about was, was very brutal. And uh, the peregrine grabbing the gull and them fighting through the air and tumbling to the ground and the gull getting away and the peregrine chasing it down, taking it down again and eventually coming out kind of gory. Um, but often uh, the way the peregrines hunt is, is a, as I said, through momentum and they'll get up way above them and hit them at a high speed and a glancing blow and either knock them out or kill them outright uh, on that glancing blow and then the bird tumbles to the ground they go and grab it. And uh, often it's up, especially on the islands, the, it's up at a higher level and they can get them out and take and glide them down to the nest, yeah. Yes? Uh, I guess it's still not clear to me why the population has increased. Is it because of the captive breeding? Well, yes, in, in both, in, I mean, the population increased faster than it would have normally because of the captive breeding. During the 92 to 94 study, half of the uh, birds on the islands, half of those nine pairs, um, were, wore blue bands, which we put on uh, before we released them after captive breeding. Um, and that was, the same, that was also true of the birds in the um, Big Sur coast uh, and in Los Angeles. Um, since then, uh, there's been more natural reproduction of birds moving from island to island or coming from mainland nests to the islands. Uh, we've also been continuing to do reintroductions in the San Ynez Valley. Um, some of those birds are moving into the um, onto the island. So there's, there's a um, recruitment from the mainland to the islands of birds that, that, were, that were born off the island. But now, there, I mean, you went from three dots to, you know, hundreds of dots, yeah. uh, including all of California. Mm -hmm. And how about, how about the huge mass up in Northern California? Well, we, di we didn't do a whole lot of reintroductions in Northern California. Those pairs uh, once they became established and we did do some, some reintroductions, those pairs took off because they were able to produce three or four young every year and all those birds survived. Um, whereas uh, the Big Sur Coast, the Channel Islands, those pairs were continually breaking their eggs, laying second clutches. A lot of, the, a lot of our, during, you know, up until 1992, we were taking the eggs before they had a chance to uh, break and then giving them one or two chicks back. So the productivity was still very low uh, in Southern California. So it sounds like the bulk of the California population was wiped out by widespread use of DDT. Mm -hmm. When that was banned, they had right. a chance, which if you could get them restarted, yes. to grow, whereas the ones down by the dump site are still being held back uh, to some right. extent. All the birds in the marine environment, um, the, the coastal birds, the bridge nesting birds, you know, right up into San Francisco Bay, all those birds are still much more affected by DDT than those birds in the northern interior just because of their diet. You know, the, the DDT, um, not just from the dump site, but from the agricultural areas, 
gets washed downstream and it works its way up through the food chain. It's fat soluble, so the insects eat it, snails and bugs and whatnot, um, and then fish eat the bugs and, and, and invertebrates, uh, and then small birds, uh, auklets, um, and then the gulls and whatnot eat the fish. And every time they eat, you know, oh, they, they accumulate all the DDT that the, their prey had, had eaten, so the birds at the top of the food chain get the highest dose. And so those birds that are feeding in the marine environment are still getting a high enough dose to depress the productivity, whereas the mainland interior birds are doing, doing well. Does the DDT affect any other thing other than HLK? Um, it's, it's a hormone mimic uh, in that uh, DDT uh, mimics uh, estrogen. And so in some um, organisms, um, there's a feminization. There's, there's more females born than, than males. Um, there's been a theory that that may be happening with peregrines. We really haven't seen it. We haven't documented it. Um, but that's, that's a concern for organochlorine um, contamination. Um, it's thought to be cancer causing, but we haven't found birds with cancer. Although, you know, we, we don't necropsy every bird we find, so um, that's, that's tough to say. But the eggshell thinning was, is the one thing that had a population level effect. And, and uh, if you can't reproduce after a while, your, your um, uh, population, your adults die off, and there's just nothing to replace them, and that's that's what caused the major decline. Yeah. The uh, port of Waimea over here is uh, going to uh, start a process of uh, burying uh, underwater about 335,000 uh, cubic uh, yards of uh, material, including uh, material with GDE. Really? And, uh, hmm. uh, they claim. Water, that there's not going to be any migration of uh, contaminants um, uh, into the water column. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I wonder who would, who would monitor that uh, uh, to make sure that that's true. And um, uh, you, you just made a comment that um, they're looking at uh, doing the same kind of CAD operation mm -hmm. uh, with the Montrose. Like they, they rejected that. Well, they, they rejected capping the, the material that's down there because by, by dumping the sand on there, it's going to blow it up into the, into the uh, water column. And so I, d I don't know how they would be planning on uh, disposing of this and then burying it, whether they're going to put it in barrels and, and try and sink them. Or they're digging a hole. They're digging a hole in the bottom of the ocean. in the bottom of the, uh, the harbor. Huh. Dredging this other material, and they're planning on dropping it from a barge through the water column into the hole. Doesn't sound very. Uh, yeah. It's in, in the port. Actually, in the harbor itself. Yeah, it's in hmm. the harbor. And, um, That's so stupid. Why not do it on land? I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, they, look, they, look, they looked at doing it on land, and it, it cost more money. Right. Well, that's. Yes. Bring it up on land. No one wanted it on land. That's mm -hmm. uh, water. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Sort of I would think that it'd have to go through an environmental review and you know an environmental they, impact statement and and the EPA would weigh into that and they uh, they did not in fact um, uh, they they will be certifying an environmental assessment hmm. um, any day now uh, I was sort of surprised that I'd I'd, I'd be surprised too yeah I hadn't I hadn't heard of that and it'd be interesting to look into. There's a total of over uh, uh, a million cubic yards of wow. material that will be moved uh -huh. in this project. Huh. And that includes making a big hole, right. moving that up. There's a question about what's, what's in that material. Uh, but they have material that has uh, 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 several other contaminants. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a lot of politics was involved in making that decision. <laughs> I've never heard of something in the harbor. No. Uh-uh. Yeah. Mind boggling. Yeah. I, I, can't, I can't fathom it. So, I don't know what it stands for. Uh, it's called a CAD. They've uh -huh. done the same process in Long Beach Harbor. Huh. Yeah. Doesn't, yeah, it doesn't sound good. You know who's doing it? 
It's done measurement. by uh, the Oxnard Harbor District in conjunction with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. Huh. I think they're, they're dredging the opening to the harbor so they can get bigger ships in, right? Well, uh -huh. um, they're, they're dredging the channels and they're also yeah. dredging um, uh, the area where the sh ships are berthed. And right. uh, over many years, uh, ships from all kinds of countries came in there uh -huh. and had all kinds of on the bottom. Right. All that right. All that's contaminated. Yeah. And so it's highly contaminated. And the solution is to bury that uh, in the harbor. And I think it relates to what you're saying. You know, we have peregrines uh, short mm -hmm. distance away yeah. that hang out at the Reliant Energy plant and supposedly down, down by the Goo Rock. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only um, way I can see that being okay is if they put a, a cover on the hole totally enclosed it and then had like a pipe that would come down and blow it in there without any way of coming out. <laughs> I they're, don't know if that's well, the way to do it. They're putting sand and gravel on top right. and putting a cap on it. And this is all 40 feet below the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, have they already done the dredging? They have not. Because uh, I hear trolls in there all the time and I've never seen a dredge in there. Huh. Um, uh, it sounds like a... a they, they plan to start <laughs> Sounds like a subject for another another talk. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Sure. Yes. I just have oh, um, a quick question about their hunting strategy. Mm -hmm. Like on Anacapa, the peregrines are out there. You know, it's gull, chick season. Right. So, are they more likely to go after an adult in flight? Because um, we see the whole island for you know all the right. go up in the air. And we hear you know can hear a peregrine. They or do they prey on the gulls sitting on land? Most of the birds they take, they take in flight because it's, it's to their advantage to, to take them as they're flying and come in behind them and hit them in the glancing blow and then you know, the bird falls to the ground or they catch them out of the air if it's a small bird. Um, smaller you know, passerines, they'll ring them up. The bird will try to get away and they'll, they'll keep uh, chasing them up and up and up until they can finally just grab them right out of the air. But I have seen birds um, using the, the waves uh, as cover especially on big windy days. They'll come off the cliffs and they'll go down and they'll fly over the waves and use them like this. And they'll thump a murelet on the head that's swimming and then come back and take several passes and pluck it off the water. Uh, grebes too, they'll do that too. Or they'll, they'll sit on the cliff and they'll, they'll watch them flying north, especially the migrating birds. And then they'll, they'll fly up and out and then swing in behind them and then use the height to get momentum and speed and come up behind them and grab them. Um, but uh, shorebirds, uh, they'll tend to take right off the right off the beach. Um, but they don't. They tend not to um, take something big like a gull that's that's sitting on the ground because the gull has the advantage. And yeah, they, they may take chicks. Although we haven't we haven't really found much in the way of, of chick remains in, in terms of gull chicks. Uh, you know, the the gull chicks are pretty heavily uh, defended by the adults. If you've ever been out on the islands when the chicks are, are breeding. But um, one thing um, I, I do want to talk about just briefly, on Santa Rosa Island, uh, we experienced a phenomenon that was first uh, told to me by the Park Service guys that are out there, the maintenance guys and the ranger. The peregrines would follow behind the truck because it, when you're driving out there on those dirt roads, you get a lot of metal lark or a lot of uh, horn larks that like to stay in the truck ruts and they'll flush in front of the truck and fly and fly and fly and fly and then land again and as you get a little closer they keep going, keep going, keep going and eventually they peel off out into the grass and the peregrines will wait on behind the truck and when that metal lark peels out they'll come right over the hood of the truck and into the grass um, and, and just run them down in the grass. It's pretty spectacular. You can even see them sometimes in the rear view mirror while you're driving. The peregrine kind of waiting along behind the truck waiting for you to flush birds. Yes sir? What is their estimated highest speed? 285 miles an hour was the was the highest recorded speed. So and and those guys, um, you know, the guys that wear the cameras on their head when they're skydiving, they can get up that fast when they when they just kind of fold themselves up and dive straight down. So they think that the peregrine can top 300 miles an hour. Yeah. Other, um, well, the the impact of DDT has obviously been really severe in populations of avian species. What about other non-avian species? Um, well, because it has, uh, it, because it, its primary effect on a population level was was the calcium, um, they haven't really seen much in the way of a, of an effect on mammalian species. Um, 
there may be, like I said, some, some hormone mimicking effects or cancer or um, uh, neurological effects. But the primary population that affects because of the calcium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, because of the transport, you know, being fat soluble, um, it, 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 uh, it doesn't really come up through like pigeons, which are grain eaters. So most of the small mammals are going to be grain eaters. Um, if, if, uh, if something were preying exclusively on shrews, which eat insects, then they may get you know, a higher dose than, than, say, a bobcat or something like that eating ground squirrels. Yes? Uh, are there any modern uh, uh, pesticide use patterns that are um, a few years ago, uh, a fellow up in Northern California put a bunch of satellite transmitters on Swainson's hawks. And Swainson's hawks migrate down to Venezuela um, and, uh, Southern, and, and South America. And so he saw that these birds were all going down there and concentrating in, in one particular area. So he got curious and he bought a plane ticket and he went down there to find them. And he went out and they were roosting in this big area on a ranch and he found hundreds of them dead. Uh, laying beneath those trees, and it turned out that the, the local ranchers were using an organophosphate pesticide, and it was very lethal to those, to those birds. And he worked with the local ag industry and the government there and got the organophosphates banned. Um, and and um, so that, that kind of halted the slow decline of Northern California Swainson's hawks that was happening. But um, that's, uh, that's the only thing I can think of off the top of my head. Um, there are some uh, concerns about um, brominated fire, fire retardants uh, that are used on upholstery and children's clothing. Um, it's now the, it's sort of the urban DDT, whereas DDT was a, a, a contaminant that was mostly in the rural and more marine areas. These brominated uh, fire retardants uh, are showing up in urban peregrines. And uh, we just had a bunch of eggs tested in the last couple of years, and they found the highest levels of any organism tested in peregrine falcon eggs that come from cities. How about just one more question? Yeah, OK. Yes? Are you using DDT anywhere in the world? They want to use DDT to combat malaria. And uh, DDT is so potent that when the guy first in, just invented it, he wanted to see how, how uh, good a, uh, an insecticide was. So he put a concentration of DDT in a beaker and he put a bunch of mosquitoes in there and they all died. I think that's my wife. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, then he then he halved the concentration and the same thing happened. And then he poured the DDT out and he put a bunch of mosquitoes in there and they all died. And then he washed the beaker and he put the, he put the mosquitoes in there and they all died. Um, so it doesn't take a whole lot of DDT, and, and the problem with using it on a wide scale is that things get built up or resistant to it. Uh, what they want to do with mosquitoes is they want to go in and spray very little uh, concentration on the walls of people's houses because the malaria mosquitoes go and they, they get a blood uh, meal and then they go and they sit on the wall and digest it. And by going into the houses and spraying very, very little, they can um, effectively control malaria mosquitoes. But it, it has such a stigma because of its effect on peregrines and other birds that uh, people are finding it very difficult to, to use. I'm sure Brian will stay and Thank if you have more questions. Sure. Thank, you. Thank you all for listening.